Hello everyone, today is Thursday, May 18, 2017, and this is Week in Charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, let's talk about this current bull leg. Now, I made the mistake of labeling it a bull leg, and you got to be careful when you label yourself in markets because you can paint yourself in the corner. And then what happened after that, we had a little spill not too long ago, and then everybody was screaming, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, in a Henny Penny fashion. And uh, I have a chicken named Henny Penny. It's kind of funny because she's always walking around going, oh, no, 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 no. But uh, anyway, so it was the end of the world, and then all of a sudden we had a pretty serious sell-off just recently, or yesterday, in fact, and everybody's kind of freaking out once again. Well, in some cases, this could actually be a buying opportunity. I'm going to show you that in just one second. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. Hold off on stock picks until we get to the live charts. And once we do, and this is for your benefit, ask about one ticker at a time and hit return. So what are we talk about this week? Well, I want to talk about following up on a methodology as it's the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever do. And that will make more sense in a minute. This week, in light of volatility returning, I want to talk about the nuances of volatility. And I want to show you a textbook TKO that's setting up. And I think this is a pretty cool thing. Shorting, real pain in the ass. So why bother? And I think I, I'm going to build a pretty good case for that. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often say, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now. And then that's a line borrowed from my friend Greg Morris. Now, I'm going to continue to follow up on this portfolio thing. And keep in mind that we're just going to follow up on the portfolio as it was way back in February. We're not following up the live portfolio. Although, in a few slides, you will see the live portfolio, but for different reasons altogether. Anyway, the point is that we've been covering, the point I'm trying to make is that we've been covering this for quite a while. You'll notice that we were on the cusp of going negative into portfolio. I know that raised an eyebrow or two. And my point was just stick, just stick with the system, stick with the methodology, follow the plan. Most of the time, that's the thing to do. Micromanagement sometimes will pay off, but that's the danger of doing that. So let's take a look at the current portfolio. Now, the only thing we have left, FYI, Based on that portfolio, you'll see the live portfolio in one second, but is this remaining position in Kim? So this presentation has become the follow-through on Kim. Let's just see how it shakes out. But you can see it was about $500 or $501 precisely gains. And then by just following the system, and you can see we had some stop out at profits and some stop out at gains. And this one looks a little dubious. This, this, this is a little bit, probably $300 different. So it's probably $3,600 here. My apologies for that. Yeah, this is the problem over here. I've got a glitch in the um, spreadsheet i got to fix. But anyway, you get the idea. Several thousand dollars versus a $500 gain by following along. Now, this won't always happen. But the point I'm trying to make is it's important to continue to follow the system, and especially when things get a little tough and things get a little bumpy. And lately, obviously, things have gotten a little bumpy, a little tough. We had a couple of uh, debacle de jures. One was just a normal stop out, and you just have to live with it, like we talked about last week. And the other one was more of a debacle, and that happened within, like, a week's period of time. But during those times, you can't – during those times, you cannot get shaken. You have to continue to just kind of plot along in it. So that's my whole point. There. Now, in light of volatility, any questions on any of that stuff before we go any further? And the reason I kind of rushed through it is we've been kind of beating a dead horse on this for, I don't know, three months now. So if you want to take a look at some more details of that, go back to November 7th. Start with that show. I think it was on November 8th was the first show we talked about it. I'm sorry, February 8th. February 7th was the day of the portfolio. February 8th was the day of the show. And then walk forward from there. Anyway, the nuances of volatility. I thought it would be important to talk a little bit about volatility today. Now, obviously, volatility can be a fairly complex subject. It doesn't have to be, though. First of all, don't worry about the formulas. They're quite complex. Just, But just like you could flip a switch and get light, you don't really have to fully understand the formulas. Just know that 
historical volatility, which I'll be talking about here in just one second, is a statistical measurement. Now, you have to be careful with statistics in the markets, and as I often preach, statistics are worthless. 75% of all people know that. But seriously, uh, just use them as a tool. And historical volatility can be a good measurement of so-called beta, meaning how volatile is the stock compared to the overall market. So if you come to these shows, a lot of times you'll see somebody will ask us a question about a stock that has an HV of like 15 or whatever. And then I'll point out that the market is, of course, it's lower than that now, but is only 15 or so. So it's very hard to beat the market. Although I know someone who will argue that otherwise, and I'll be happy to take them on someday. But it's very hard to beat the market with stocks that are less volatile than the market. Now, sometimes you'll get what I call a volatility fake out. And to understand what that is, just know that volatility tends to be cyclical. Prices tend to, or I'm sorry, volatility tends to wax and wane. So one thing that I learned from Larry Connors many, many years ago, in fact, I was doing a lot of volatility research on my own, inspired by a lot of his work, which he referenced, what's his name, Natenberg, so I studied him too. And one thing that Larry says is that volatility is more cyclical than price. So I, I went on a crusade for a while to figure out how I could trade volatility versus price. And I thought psychologically trading volatility might be easier than trading price, but I came, uh, I, I didn't go too far off into the deep end of volatility. I, st I stuck with the, with the simple trade following. But the, the things I learned were I was able to incorporate into my trend following. So the point I was trying to make about volatility is when I kind of went off on that tangent for a while, what I was thinking was it would actually remove some of the psychological biases you might have by looking at the price by simply studying volatility because volatility seemed to be a little bit more antiseptic than price. But anyway, that's just kind of a little background on me. You don't have to worry about that. The, bo the bottom line here is just know that volatility has a cycle. And periods of high volatility follow low volatility, and periods of low volatility follow high volatility. Now, the beauty of it is, and this is something that I've sort of discovered on my own and with the help, with a little bit of help of Larry, is that it does tend to overshoot itself when it expands. And we could use that in some cases to our advantage. Now, here's the big thing. The First moves in a volatility situation from a low volatility situation are often low ones. And I wrote an article, I'm dating myself, way back in 1998 in Stocks and Commodities called A Volatility Trade in Gold. And basically what I was talking about there was the volatility had dropped off, and I'm going to show you this in the overall market right now as a current example, and gold had compressed in volatility, okay? And the point was that the first move was a fake out, and the next move was the real move. Now, taking a look at yesterday's market, this is the 650 HV ratio. HV stands for historical volatility. Some people call it statistical volatility. I don't care what you call it as long as you don't call me late for supper. Um, it's just the bell curve thing where... There's a two-third percent chance, based on the statistics, that the market will be within that two standard deviations or whatever the case is. And the reason I'm trying to gloss over this is don't worry about the formula and all. Just know that it measures how much a stock has moved around in the past. And you'll see here, like notice that, on, and it's on a closing basis too, notice the closes haven't changed much back in this area here up and down, but relatively a change. We'll notice that the volatility began to implode during that period. Now, after a period of low volatility, you tend to have a period of higher volatility. So this is a six-day volatility versus a 50-day volatility based on historical volatility. Now, I don't want to get in myself, I don't want to get myself in a lot of trouble quickly to show you what little I know about statistics and math. But the way I understand it, if it behaved on a purely statistical fashion, 
whatever the HV percentage is, okay, there's a two-thirds percent, there's a two-thirds chance that the market will be that percent higher or lower a year from now, okay? So if you see an HV of 100, then that stock's either going to be 100 percent higher or 100 percent lower a year from now, okay? There's a two-thirds chance. Now, again, you got to be really careful with statistics when it comes to markets because markets are not normally distributed. I thought only price pays. Only price does pay, Howard. Pay attention. We'll get to that. So notice that recently, now this is the ratio. So we take the six-day period and we compare it to the 50-day period. So the 50-day becomes a bit of a baseline. And then when the 50-day goes below half of the longer-term baseline, the 50-day, I'm sorry, the six when the 6 goes below the 50, then you know that volatility is really due to expand. So notice that volatility really dried up here as the market just kind of bumped along. And on a closing basis, it really didn't change much for a while. And then notice that yesterday we got the expansion. Now, what's interesting is your first move is often your false move from a low volatility situation. So notice we had this massive increase in volatility yesterday and what happened with the market. The market sold off hard. So the play would be instead of trying to jump on that bandwagon of the market head lower at this particular point in time, especially when you have what? A big blue arrow. This is supposed to be blue, pointing higher. Then the play would be to buy it above this high because what did I say earlier? The first move is often a false one when it comes to volatility. Okay, So to kind of follow up on Howard's point, if you were to trade volatility, everything works better with trend. That's, that's my mantra. Okay, So trade it in the direction of the trend, but look for something like a TKO. Look for that expansion to be opposite of the trend and then look to get back on that trend or get on that trend to begin with when the market begins to rally. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you a textbook TKO in just one second. In fact, let's just get to that right now. Now, these slides, as you see, are from my Trading Full Circle course, FYI, available now. Get started for free. <laughs> now, occasionally you get a nice defined entry and a stop, and these points are which the points also give you a an initial profit target. Okay, let me rewind that a little. Well, let's just look at the chart. It'll make more sense. Yeah, fat finger or something here. All right, so the point I was trying to make here is sometimes you get a nice wide range bar down with a poor close. So the chances of this stock or market or whatever coming all the way back up aren't really great, okay, because this thing is in trouble. But if it can go all the way back up and trigger an entry, then it might be a setup worth taking. And then the beauty is if it does trigger that entry, then you know that if it triggers the entry, then it returns all the way back down to the lows then maybe it really is in trouble. It was a fake out of the fake out. But when you see a nice, strong trend, this is a longer term trend, it's also accelerating. It's kind of hard to see on this zoomed in chart. But trust me, it is. So your entry to your stop is going to be your risk. And the beauty of that is if you just add that into your entry, now you get your initial profit target, okay? So this textbook setup gives you everything you need. It gives you your entry, your stop, and the initial profit target. So the methodology is there, the money management's there, it's all rolled into one. So all that's left for you is to follow the plan, so the trading psychology. Unfortunately, we can never solve for trading psychology with just price alone. That's up to you. Now, let's take a look at what that looks like 
the NASDAQ composite right now is set up as a textbook TKO. But I took a look at the Qs just to give you something that's actually tradable. Now, I'm not suggesting you rush out and trade the Qs, although you could. And the reason I'm not suggesting you do that is I believe that you're much better off trading less efficient markets. Indices are hard to trade as a general statement. But every now and then, they can set up. In this particular case, notice that the Qs have been working their way higher for a long, long time. And now they have begun to accelerate higher. And further, notice that it tends, it has tended to go up day after day after day after day after day. Now, if you draw a line through as many bars as you can, which I didn't really do a good job. Uh, let me see if I can do a little bit better job. Maybe that's kind of close enough. Mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression, but I just like to draw a line through the bars, and I just call that persistency. So we have had a nice persistent uptrend, and then this is your knockout move. Now, without going into a lot of details about the knockout, the point is that it's knocking out some players. It's sucking in some potential shorts, or some possible shorts, I should say. And if the market turns around and goes right back up, it's going to spit out those shorts or... Even better, they're going to be forced to cover at higher levels. So when you see a market with a poor close like this and a wide range bar down relative to its prior trend, then you can almost trade it in a purely textbook fashion. Maybe give it a little bit of wiggle room above the entry. But you can enter above the high for the most part. And then again, maybe a little wiggle room, but you can put a stop in below the low. And then add those two or subtract the, subtract the stop from the entry. Take the difference of these two and broadcast that up here, and that's going to give you your initial profit target. So again, everything's kind of rolled into one when you get these textbook sort of setups. So they should they should jump out at you like a sore thumb. So that's kind of a cool thing there, and I'll try to find you a live one or two when we get to the charts. Now, any questions on TKOs or textbook TKOs before we go any further? When we get to the live charts, I'll, I'll show you one that's in the works. I think I have one in the work. All right, while I'm waiting on that, every time the market begins to sell off a little bit, I get questions on whether shorting is worth it or not. To short or not to short, that is a question. Well, quite frankly, let me rewind that. Quite frankly, they're a pain in the ass. I cannot be more bluntly <laughs> about shorts, okay? Now, why is that? Well, shorting is a lot more difficult than it looks. I remember when I first started trading, I had some initial success. I did really well. And then, of course, hit the inevitable drawdown. And doing that drawdown, I'm like, well, shoot, my stocks are going down anyway. I might as well get paid for it. I mean, I jumped in head first into all this. I was trading options within about a week or two of trading stocks. Okay, Not that I recommend you rush out and trade stocks or rush out and short. I'm sorry, rush out and trade options or rush out and short. But it's like I had to get it all out of my system. And one thing I quickly found out was shorting is a lot more difficult than it looks. And one reason is it's tough to ride out longer term trends due to sharp retrace rally. So what happens is, let's say you get into a nice little first thrust, a bow tie or whatever, the market begins to sell off and you're feeling pretty good, right? Well, it'll have this sharp retrace rally quite often and then begin to implode. So it'll knock you out and then continue lower. So that can be quite frustrating on the short side. There's an old Wall Street adage, old short, old shorts, all shorts Will, go, will initially go against you. That seems to be one of the more truer adages. Seems like any time I've shorted something, I very seldomly get paid right away. I have to be very patient and be willing to let it go against me a little bit. Now, your profit is 100% max, and that's what a lot of people argue. So let's say you short and the stock goes down to zero, okay? Well, from there to there is 100%, okay? It can never be any more. Now, 
you can trade around positions. Now, this is methodology 2.0. If you were fortunate enough, and again, it's not always that easy, but let's say you were able to short and you were able to take some partial profits and you had a fairly loose trailing stop. Well, in some cases, you could reshort. In other words, trading around positions. And then you can make a lot more than 100% on a trade. But yes, to those who argue against shorting, the most you could ever make on an outright position is 100%. But you can, again, trade around positions. Now, the other argument that you hear quite often is there is a potential for unlimited losses. That is true, okay? Let's say you short a stock at 10, okay? It goes to 20, and it goes to 30, and it goes to 40, and it goes to, I don't know, 400, okay? You got quite the loss on your hands, all right? I don't know what that is, about 4,000% loss or whatever. But keep in mind, that's only for the stupid, okay? We're trend, what? Followers, okay? So if you short a market and the trend was this way, well, if this market starts making brand new highs, then the trend is this way, okay? So you're stupid. You have to get out of the way. You might also be an obstinate person with unlimited cash. So let's say you short a market here. starts going up and up and up and up and up and up. Now, the reason you need a limited cash is your broker is going to call you when you run out of cash and say, hey, you need to put some more margin in your account. So you're going to have to keep feeding that account in order to have an unlimited loss. Now, here's the thing. Your broker's such a nice guy. If you stop feeding that account, he will kindly exit that position for you. It's called a margin call, and that's why you don't answer him, okay? <laughs> and by answering a margin call, I mean adding money to your account to keep a negative position afloat, okay? So, Yes, in theory, you could lose unlimited amounts of money, but in reality, you would have to have unlimited amounts of money to lose, and you'd also have to be real stupid. Of course, a stock could get bought out or something bad could happen. Bad for you, good for the stock possibly. Prove a drug or whatever. And you would be a hurt and pop, but you wouldn't have an unlimited loss. I mean, you'd be shaken, but not stirred in a situation like that. Now, there are some logistics involved. You do have to borrow the stocks to short. Now, if a stock is hard to borrow, when you when you get into your account, and I use, um, there's a few online brokerages, uh, Investors, what's the name of that uh, brokerage? Uh, Interactive Brokers comes to mind, has a, uh, uh, on their website, you can look at the amount of shares available to borrow. And if I see 20 million shares of value to available to borrow, then I don't have a problem. I was like, okay, well, I know that's a fairly liquid issue for shorts, and I don't have to worry too much, or as much, I should say, about short squeeze. So if it's hard to borrow, don't short to begin with. And there's also what's called the callback, okay? And the, it's this is a little hard to explain, but let's say you borrow it from, uh, let's say you borrow your shares from Joe, okay? And Joe was holding those shares in those account, and so... You borrow those. Thank you very much, Joe. I just shorted your shares. You're welcome, you know. <laughs> and then Joe decides that he wants to sell his shares, okay? Well, now you've got to, your shares need to be replaced. And if they're not replaceable, they get called back. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but sometimes something gets called back. You, you, you have to wonder if there's some fun and games going on. Who knows? But if you are truly committed to that position and it hasn't done anything wrong, let's say you're down here in trend-following mode, then maybe, I don't want to complicate things too much, but maybe, just maybe, you put some, put some puts on or whatever to replace that position, some deep-in-the-money puts. If you look at my first book, and I'll be happy to send you the chapter if you like, anybody watching this, I have a, a chapter on, on options as a substitution for stock. As a general rule, I don't recommend it, but sometimes on the short side, it could work out nicely due to those aforementioned problems. And sometimes you could substitute an option position for a stock that gets called back. Okay. And again, this week's lesson is not 
how to short. This week's lesson is more of why you should short, even though they're a pain in the butt with all these logistics and nuances. So the reason you want to short, well, it's twofold. The Captain Obvious reason is that it's the only way to make money in down markets. Okay, unless of course there's some commodity or something that could trade contra the overall market, or you have the mother of all setups. But for the most part, if the market is headed lower, you're fighting an uphill battle trying to buy something in a down market. Okay, 2007, 2008, we shorted fairly heavily. That's what we do with trend followers. Okay, that's how we roll. So obviously, it's the only way to make money in down markets, but there's a much bigger reason why I think you should short. And that reason is it helps you to see both sides of the market. I'm friends with a lot of people in the industry. Okay. I'm not bragging. I'm not going to name drop. I'm just friends with a lot of people. And if you're in the industry long enough, you eventually meet pretty much everybody. And I know a lot of guys especially through the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. So, and I was a board member for that for a year or so. And through the process and the meetings, et cetera, I met a lot of people. And I would never throw anyone under the bus, but through meeting people through that organization and in general and through the things that I do by getting out there, I find that my friends and peers that run a lot of money and who are long, long only oriented for whatever reason, not necessarily because they only want to be long oriented, but because their charter only allows them to be, or they really come to the realization that shorting is just not worth it because it is a pain in the ass. Okay, but they all tend to be long story endless. I know too late, but they all these long only money managers managers they tend to be a little bit glass half full all the time, and you can't. And a lot of times they're right because. In general, yes, there is an upside bias to the markets, although they can drop about 50% or more every now and then. But as a general statement, yes, it's an upside bias. So a lot of times by being glass half full, margin call. See, I'm not going to answer that. That's a margin call, right? Don't answer it. So anyway, they never see the, the market as glass half empty. It's always pretty much glass half full. And a lot of times they're right. But I think it's important to pull in your horn sometimes when things get a little iffy. Now, the other thing that they can do is they can help to mitigate your losses if you have some shorts in your portfolio and the market begins to roll over, obviously. Now, I would strongly urge you not to use shorts as a hedge. I think hedging... Is a, and, and I don't want to get into too much detail on this, but I can talk quite extensively on it. Hedging as a general statement is a bad idea. And it's kind of, I don't want to digress too far now. It's too late with me often, but I was looking at some Facebook comments yesterday in one of the stock groups, and, you know, these guys are like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've been shorting and we're hedged and blah, 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 blah. Don't get sucked into these people telling you this BS, Okay. Hedging is incredibly difficult, and it costs a lot of money. It costs you on both outright money, and it costs you in opportunity costs. And, yeah, on a day like yesterday, that's great. You're hedged, okay? But on the rest, the rest of the time, you're going to make a lot less money than the, than the just pure trend follower would make. So I wouldn't see them as a hedge in and of themselves, okay? But if you see a great short, then I would say take it. But as a general statement, do not fight the trend. And this is reminiscence, uh, reminiscent of 2007 when the market was making these marginal new highs, but all-time highs. And you know me as a trend follower, trend following moron, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to believe that the market has had it higher. But I couldn't find a long setup to save my life buy side setup that is so uh, we started shorting and I actually apologized to my clients like look guys I cannot find anything on the long side to save my life but here's a short and then here's another short and then here's another short 
and we ended up heavily short going into 2008. We ended up heavily short coming into 2016, okay? And it paid off fairly nicely. But again, as a general statement, you're not going to get rich on the short side. I kind of see it as, again, seeing both sides of the market and number two, making a little money on the downside while waiting for the upside. And you might want to write that down. But be careful to use them as a hedge. Now, yesterday we did have one short on, and that helped the portfolio a little bit. We got whacked fairly hard yesterday. I'm not trying to sweep that under the rug. And that's to be expected. If you're long a lot of high beta stocks like we like to trade, high volatility type of stocks, then you're going to get whacked here and there, especially when the market begins to get uh, sell off overall. But the point I'm trying to make is by having a short in here, the delta, the change, okay, in that one short went up a thousand bucks on a hundred K per 100 K. So that was like a 1% gain. So this number went down, but it was mitigated by having a short in here. Now, don't rush out and put on a lot of shorts when the market is making all time highs. But every now and then you see something that looks like it could be in trouble and it's worth shorting, then by all means, go out and put on a short. But do not try to have half shorts and half longs. Now, I like to see the portfolio as an ebb and flow. So we got this short on. Now, if, God forbid, we start stopping out of some of these longs and I start seeing shorts, then I'll start putting shorts on. And sometimes it's a beautiful thing, okay? Equity curve will look something like, let's see if we can get a blank screen in here. So let's say the overall market is rolling over like this, and then you're long. Well, your portfolio is going to look like this. But if you start putting on shorts, sometimes it might look like this, flatten out a little bit, and then look, look like this again. I, it's a little bit dated, but somewhere out there, I've got a YouTube where I show the discretionary portfolio, and it looks a lot like that. The discretionary portfolio looks like this, and then it does this. And you'll notice that the market did this, and then the market did that, okay? So if you were just a pure buy and hold trader, you would really start losing your butt here. But you would, at least on a relative basis, make a lot more compared to the overall market by being able to short or being willing to short. But again, they're a pain in the butt. If you do the trading, don't do it. Do some on paper. Get a feel for it. Realize that the map is not the territory. Once you actually start shorting, you'll find out what a real pain they are. Howard says, Fidelity Act trading screen gives shares availability to shorts on screen two. Is the ride down on the shorts quicker? Well, the ride down is quicker, but it's much more treacherous. Now, there's, a, there's an old Wall Street adage, they slide faster than they glide. And then, of course, a pilot emails me and says, well, Dave, a glide, you actually go lower. I was like, come on, work with me, all right? The old Wall Street adage is like, this is, this is what an uptrend looks like, okay? And this is what a downtrend looks like, okay? Actually, a downtrend looks like this. Oops, let me try that again. This is what a downtrend looks like. Is there a way to erase these? Okay. So, again, let's try this again. An uptrend might look something like this, okay? And then... A downtrend might look something like this, okay? So from a trend following perspective, this is going to be a hell of a lot harder to trade than that. Now, one thing that I do like to do is if you see a market that's kind of rolling over, this first little drop here can be quite significant, okay? And that's where a lot of the money is made on the short side. As a general statement, longer-term trend following mode is really tough. It was... It, the only time I remember where it wasn't extremely tough was, was in the middle of 2008 when most everything was going down into early 2009. And then obviously in 2009, in March, you had some pretty serious retrace rallies. Now, there's another Wall Street adage that says stocks take the stairs up or the escalator up and the elevator down. And that makes some sense, too. What's kind of interesting, though... I mean, it's a general statement that's probably a true adage. Well, it's kind of a, an interesting point 
And 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 again, there's so many little small things I've learned through the American Association of Perfect Professional Technical Analysts. Little bitty things I learned, not these big epiphanies or whatever, but they have talked quite a bit about tops being more of a process and bottoms being an event. You always think that a top is an event, you know, like a bam, the market gets cream and comes unglued. But a lot of times bottoms can be an event. Like 2009, the market comes flying off its lows, so it becomes more of an event. And that's because everything is so sold out and people are so short that there's a big rush to the door to cover, and then a lot of the bargain hunters rush in all at once. So that's kind of an interesting thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind that when, not if, we get into a longer-term bear market, it'll probably end, the end will be quickly. It won't end quickly, but the when it finally does end, it'll happen as more of a process than an event, as a general statement, okay? Sam says, and I'm pretty sure he's making the voice, what about the situation in Nigeria? Well, we're going to talk about that, actually. I'm glad you brought that up. And portfolio building, IBD emphasized time diversification as a natural benefit of buying positions over time. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, I think that's one of those things that sounds better in theory, but I don't know about theory versus practice. But it does tend to happen. I think that's a fancy way of saying ab and flow. He's talking about time diversification. Because a lot of people ask me, like, well, trading your methodology, wouldn't you end up with, like, 50 positions on? It's like, no, it doesn't really work that way because – First of all, you're picking the best of the best setups. And then as you get more and more and more and more trades in your portfolio, like right now we've got quite a few trades on, as you can see. So I'll become more and more and more selective where I might be sitting on my hands for a while. So, yes, you could establish quite a few. If you want to look at, like, number of positions established, it might look like something like, like if, let's say, time is the bottom axis. And then... I'm going to draw a number of positions. So, so let's say this is time going this way, obviously. So you might look like this, you number of positions, and then you get quite a few on, and maybe the market's choppy or something, so you're not putting any on. Then you start putting positions on again, okay? So, yeah, I hear you. So you'll, you will end up establishing some over time, and then possibly that ebb and flow, you could end up with some shorts on. Now, the reason we took that short in EMS was because the banks and the brokers were rolling over. And I hoped, and I know you should never say hope in this business, but I was hoping that the market wouldn't roll over, but just in case it did, at least I'd have a short or two on. And then if you turned it to like 2007, I think October, November is when we started shorting fairly heavily, you start seeing more and more and more sectors, and it's harder and harder to find long side setups. Okay, now the question about Nigeria is, what about the situation in Nigeria? Well, in light of the recent events, some thoughts on the news. Now, to those of you who don't know, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but basically the situation in Nigeria is, is someone that was very adamant about the news because my trades and potential new trades were contra to logic in the news or logic basis of the news, and they were very upset about it. So just to recap from last week, go and watch last week's show. I ignore all news. Read my lips, okay? This doesn't mean that news does not affect markets. It does. But trying to predict the markets based on news is an exercise in futility. All right, any questions on anything? Hey, guess what? It's here. I've been rolling out my Trading Full Circle course. And if you want to sign up for free, go to this link right here, trade-stocks-successfully. Or right now you can go to my homepage, and there's a, um, the banner ad is for the course. Uh, reviews have been pretty good so far. So, so far, so good. And I still have some filming left to do, so... Um, I've been welcoming that feedback. So check it out. A couple of more announcements. Uh, I'm still rolling out the learning management system, or LMS, as it's called in the industry. And I'm pretty excited about this. Now, when you start taking the 
trading full circle course, the base videos and all, they're not in the learning management system. If you if you actually get the course, the whole course, they are and it's it has a little bit more of that learning management characteristics to it. By by that I mean it's a module where you have to take the test and you have to complete the tests and you have to score, I think I have it set at 80 or above before moving on to the next module. And the beauty of that is it made me really realize the amount, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying it made me realize the amount of content that I put even into the first four base videos. And there's a lot there and there's a lot of, of salient points that you must realize when it comes to the markets. So I'm kind of excited about that too. Also, <laughs> it's really going to help me. I'm not going to be big brother. Don't worry about that. But you know, I've had people email me for 10 years and they, they're making all these crappy trades. And I'm like, what is wrong with this guy? Is this guy mentally challenged? And, you know, I'll say something like, go in and reread this chapter or go in and reread that chapter. And then I'll get a confession from them after like 10 years. You know, I've been meaning to buy your book. It's like, good Lord, why would you trade someone's methodology without learning it? But this way, I could go in and say, well, you're asking me all these questions, but you didn't actually watch the video and you didn't pass the test. So go in and do your homework. I'll help anyone who helps themselves, okay? And those of you who know me know that's true. So the base is now available. So start taking that. Shameless plug. Uh, delayed service. I haven't been updating much lately, but I need to get back on that and start doing that. But uh, I don't have an easy. I don't have a link for you on this one. So email me if you need the link on that. I'm redoing the website a little bit as time allows. Time. That's funny. <laughs> well, speaking of which, I do. For those of you who aren't familiar, I do keep myself incredibly busy. And that stops me from day trading and micromanaging and uh, holding on to losers too long and, and all these other host of bad behaviors and trading in less than ideal conditions and picking mediocre stocks. I try to only trade when I can't stand it. If I see a setup where I feel like I have to have it and I would really be aggravated if that stock took off without me, then I trade. And one way you reach that point is just keep yourself Busy. I know I've told the story a thousand times, but recently I had a client. All of a sudden, he starts doing much better, and it's because he got really, really busy, not because he had some epiphany in the markets. And now he only trades when he has time to trade. He's not firing off day trades. Now, see, I kept that short. All right, let's take a look at the live charts. If you guys want to start talking about individual stocks, feel free to ask me. All right, let's take a look at the, let's start off with the overall market and then work our way into the sectors. And then we'll take a look at your stock picks. So keep the stock picks coming. Good. Yeah, just, just let me know. Whatever you want to talk about, we'll talk about it. I see nothing down here involving actual trading. Every now and then I go in that group just to piss them off. You guys ever talk about trading in here? All right, let's look at the piece. Well, things were going on along swimmingly uh, a few days ago. And as a general statement, you want to err on the side of longer term trim in the market is at or near new highs, right? And the reason it is, if a market is going to go from, from A to C and B, let's say B is right here, somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B. So as long as the market is at or near new highs, give it the benefit of the doubt, first and foremost, as a trend follower. Now, remember, you're always going to be wrong as a trend follower in the end. Okay, It comes with the territory. All trends, all trades, for that matter, eventually and badly. But I'm going to use the word hope, but hopefully somewhere in between you're able to make some money and make it all worthwhile. But yes, peas did begin to implode a little bit, and it's certainly not the end of the world. Now, here's the amazing thing, and this goes back to that cyclical volatility deal. You have everybody in their brother rushing for the door. Okay? This guy is falling. Ah! <laughs> you know? 
Media's going ape shit. <laughs> the Dow is down 367 points. Ah, oh, it's in the world. You know, it's stupid. <laughs> and then what happens the next day? Eh, the market has a shoulder shrug. shrug. This always amazes me. And I've been at this for a long, long time. But it, it's just taught me, just don't get too caught up in it. Don't freak out, okay? But as you can see, we're up a little bit today. We're not setting the world on a fire on fire, but we're up a quarter percent. Doesn't mean this is over with. Doesn't mean that something bad won't still happen. Okay. But don't get sucked into one bad day. Sometimes the market has a bad day. Okay. Now, you know me, I sure would like to see the S&P get out of its range and not look back for a while. Since Phil's here, let's throw in a 50-day moving average, which we went below yesterday. And let's see. All right, so you can see nothing magical about the 50-day moving average, but we did dip below it yesterday. And who knows, we might get back the back above it today. Now, one thing I would encourage you to do, pick your favorite moving average. I usually like the bow tie moving averages, but you can pick any one you want. I know Phil likes the 50, so we'll look at the 50. Look for daylight, lows greater than the moving average. And I cover this in a lot of detail in those uh, beginner videos of the uh, Trading Full Circle course. So get jump into course. There's a lot of good stuff in there. There's zero obligations, okay, zero, absolutely none. So feel free to start the course, and I won't spam you, I promise. But if you pay attention to daylight and slope, two very, very powerful concepts. In fact, what I encourage you to do when you get to that video in the course, you'll see that I say, as homework, go out, plot a variety of moving averages in a variety of markets and study slope and daylight. You're welcome. If all you ever did was that, I think that you would be pretty damn good in the markets. You would know when it's in an uptrend. You would know it's in a downtrend. And you would know whether or not you're on the right side of the market or not. Okay? Seriously. Pretty damn simple concept, but incredibly powerful. I'm still blown away by how some of this simple stuff could work so well. And, in, and then in the videos, that's why I tell the story. That's why I trademark trading simplified because it amazes me. You know, if you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or whatever, just draw some blue arrows on the chart, okay? Or just, if you must, throw in a moving average. Now, moving averages do have their uses, but I like to use them sparingly. That's why you'll see that 90% of the time I don't put it in a chart. I do like to put the 50 in when the market is a little questionable to know whether or not it's above or below the 50, and that's simply because a 50-day moving average is well watched, okay? But as you can see, a little bit of a dip yesterday, not the end of the world, sideways at best as of late. Longer term, we're still in an uptrend. But you can see even the 50s beginning to flatten out a little bit. No cause for concern, but if we have a lot of daylight below, meaning that the highs are less than the moving average, then we might want to be a little bit concerned, maybe pulling our horns a little bit. Remember what I said earlier, way back in 2000, late 2050, late 2060, we were what? We were shorting stocks, okay? Luckily, the bear market did not materialize. But as a trend follower, that's what we do. We follow the trend. It's that simple. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ obviously looks a little bit better than the P's. In fact, as I said earlier, I think it's a buy above the high. Put in a stop below the low if you want or a stop below today's low if it triggers in and go for it. Also, nice little hookup pattern here. I'm not a day trader, and I would recommend that you don't day trade. Let's take a look at the cues, see if we get a better example. Maybe not. Uh, but sometimes you get these little hookup patterns where you, let me see if I can draw that, where you have a market, especially after a week close like this. And again, you want to trade in the direction of the trend. Or let's say you got a TKO move and the market closes way down here. Well, sometimes you get a little hookup the next day. Market will gap lower on some initial follow through, but immediately reverse. And this is actually a tradable pattern. I don't rush out and do a lot of that type of trading because to me it's just for like S and G's. It's not your bread and butter. Your real bread and butter is and will always be in the longer term trend following. Okay. And we get to that longer term trend following how we start off with a swing trade and we stick with it. 
But the NASDAQ looks pretty good. I mean, nice little breakout remains intact so far. Banging on new highs just a few days ago. All-time highs. Sharp sell-off, a little hook up. Now, check back often. Let's see where we are tomorrow. Let's see where we're on Monday. Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, okay, of next week. But I would not get too excited just yet. Let's throw the 50 in just in case Phil's paying attention. And notice that we still have nice daylight below the 50. We've had daylight, for the most part, going all the way back to what? Late November. What did I just say? This simple concept alone can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, how many idiots out there were calling a top? Oh, into the world here. Oh, it's into the world. Oh, it's into the world. You know, yesterday we were probably saying, I told you so. I know some, some I'm not going to call them what I think they are, but they were saying this day here was the end of the world. And what did the market do? Went up and banging out new highs. Now, in the end, it's going to end badly, okay? It's going to look something like this, okay? So what? Don't be a hero. You don't get paid for being right. You get paid for what? Making money. So until proven wrong, and usually all you do, really have to do is use a stop on your positions, stick with your positions. Now, Russell 2000 remains a bit of a disappointment. Notice that it's gone sideways for a very, 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 very long time. So you can argue here that eh, the trend is sideways, okay? Much, much longer term, it's still in an uptrend, okay? But it has gone sideways for quite a while. And then again, notice the downside daylight, downside daylight, upside daylight, upside daylight, upside daylight, and then just kind of meandering back and forth around that moving average, okay? So it's choppy now. So that's kind of ugly, and yesterday was pretty ugly, down, what, about 2 3%, what was it? 2% and 3 quarters, round numbers. Now, if it takes out the bottom of its range, then I think that's cause for concern, but let's not get too excited just yet, okay, when it comes to the Russell. Now, one good thing that did happen yesterday in both the stocks and the commodities is the gold stocks rallied, and let's take a look at the gold, the commodity, Gold, the commodity, actually had a decent little rally yesterday. Let's see what it did. 1.82%. So I wouldn't rush out and buy gold, but it was good to see that it wasn't a pure liquidation market. A pure liquidation market, the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. And they're really scary. If you come in and the futures are getting creamed, and then the market opens and gold is getting cream or gold futures are getting cream pre-market for that matter. And then bonds are getting cream. Boy, there's there's something going on. It's, it's hitting the fan, right? Something bad is happening. But at least yesterday, it's a very small silver lining. But at least yesterday you had a tiny bit of so-called flight to safety. Okay, notice bonds had a pretty serious rally yesterday. So that's certainly... And obviously a good thing. Okay, so when you see gold and, and gold and bonds going down along with the overall market, that's what you that's what you really have to worry. Okay, at least shorter term, it's a really scary thing. Now, as far as the sector action, most sectors, especially technology related sectors, look pretty good, even though they had a bit of a pullback. Now, on the downside, some of these areas that have been looking a little dubious, remember I've been bearish in the banks for a while. Banks tried to come back up, but so far it's still kind of looking toppy, complex head and shoulder looking, if you want to call it that. The brokerages, especially the national ones, that's why we're short the EMS. Okay, you can see major, major top in place, kind of a first thrust down. But look, what did I just say? Short side is not a smooth ride lower, okay? Notice we had sharp retraces, and Phil will point out, hey, Dave, where would that retrace in? Well, right at the 50, Phil, okay, right at the 50. Let's take a look at that MS. Yeah, look what MS did, same sort of thing. This is what I call kiss the ma goodbye, the MA, kiss MA goodbye. So, I mean, that's actually a tradable pattern. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it in and of itself, but notice that it comes down here, kiss the moving average goodbye, takes off, kiss the moving average goodbye, takes off. Then it begins to break down. One little kiss of the moving average, and it begins to take off again. 
the downside in this particular case. So yeah, that's a tradable pattern. It's a pretty cool pattern for what it's worth. Anyway, for the most part, most sectors looks pre look pretty good. A couple exceptions. Obviously, energy is not looking so hot. Metals and mining, not looking so hot either. I wouldn't rush out and short those particular areas. What I would do on the short side is if you do see something at high levels that's just beginning to roll over, such as the MS recently, then go after it. Now, on the short side, I'm not going to go into a diatribe on this, so don't worry. But on the short side, a couple things. I like thick stocks for the most part on the short side. You don't really want to short thin stocks because a lot, a lot of bad to short things can happen to you. And so I like to short thick stocks. I also like to short stocks that are a little bit more efficient. So on the long side, you'll see me in these crazy-ass HV stocks, high HV, high beta stocks. On the short side, you'll see me almost in just the opposite to some extent. And the reason is that you have inefficiency that could come from efficiency or inefficient moves that can come from efficiency. Because a big thick stock, everything is pretty much priced into the stock. And when things begin to unravel a little bit, a lot of people run to the door at the same time. Okay. And and the reason I'm not going to go into a lot of details on that is because I have a report out there. If you go to my website, I make you walk through the gift shop first. But if you go to shop now or go to daylandry.com slash store, scroll down to the bottom. Feel free to buy something on your way. A little impulse item, maybe. And my wife will thank you. And when you get to the free reports, download what I call the Go Go No Mo, which is a shorting strategy for these type of stocks. And that's why I like it when the banks, stocks that actually have fundamentals, not that I could give a flip about their actual fundamentals, but stocks that are actually judged more on their fundamentals than their promise. Okay? For the go-go momentum stocks, which I love to trade, they're not really judged on fundamentals. They're judged on their promise. But these more efficient issues that can fall from grace, such as the banks and financials, et cetera, they're judged more on their fundamentals, okay? All right, let's start looking at some of these. Uh, Jeff Dunham, who's Jeff Dunham? Is that the guy with the puppets or is that somebody else? Who's got the puppets? Jeff, what's his name? <laughs> I could actually think of one of his, Spark of Insanity. I saw it yesterday on Netflix. I didn't actually watch it. Jeff Dunham, is he a hedge fund guy or something? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Jeff Dunham does not be worried. Keep your day job. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about the, the invitations? <laughs> okay, a big stock sliding has some features of high HV. Yeah, well, you're going to get that expansion of volatility when that stock does begin to slot. I agree. Um, and you're looking for some sort of efficiency. Go back and look, and you can get the archives on my website, and you can get them if you're on a delayed service. But go back and look at the stocks we shorted coming into 2016, all the banks and all, low HV stocks that looked like they were in trouble. But then that HV begins to expand. So we're looking for an expansion of volatility in the direction of the new trend. And that's why we're willing to trade these more efficient stocks. All right, let's, uh, let's open up. You are preaching the gospel. Thank you, Howard. IYT, divergent. Dow Theory says lower. I'm not a big fan of Dow Theory. But I am a big fan of the more pieces that fit, the better. If anything, I would, I would instead of Dow theory, I would use semiconductor theory, okay? Now, to those of you who don't know what Dow theory is, Dow theory just means that the transport should confirm what's going on. I'm simplifying it, but the transport should confirm what's going on in the overall market. And in some cases, maybe there's some merit there. In some cases, there's some merit there. The reason that Dow theory came about was in the early 1900s, the theory is that, okay, if goods are selling, then goods need to be moving. They have to put them on the trains and move them on the trains. And I guess in some cases that's still relevant today because I guess Amazon.com has to ship you the product. So there's some relevance there, I suppose. But the way I wrap my head around Dow theory is the more pieces that fit, the better. So let me throw in semiconductor theory first 
as opposed to Dow theory. So let's uh, let's see if we can add a comparison to this chart. I could never do this on the fly. Let's see tools. How do I do this? Uh, is it an edit? Yeah, comparison symbol. Here we go. So I'm going. You can't see this on your screen. Let's see if I can move it over. I'm going to change the comparison symbol to the SMH, I guess, for lack of something better. And then I'm going to plot that. Plot that. Um, something that'll stand out, like a like an orange or something. All right, let's take a look at that. Let's see what that looks like. Nope, didn't work. All right. Oh, I didn't say visible, did I? All right, let's take a look at it now. Okay. Now, we'll change this to IYT in one second, Howard. Uh, but I believe in, let's call it semiconductive theory. If you want to get fancy, you know, if you, if you guys have some time to do some research, uh, if you have a stockcharts.com account, I don't get paid anything from them. Um, I was recommended that I write for them, but they never asked me to, so uh, I have no relationship with them. Other than I'm friends with Greg Morris, who I think still owns part of it. He's the one that recommended me. Um, I guess he doesn't own enough of it to get me on there. <laughs> but I digress. But anyway, a stockcharts.com account, you could divide one by the other, and that's going to give you like a relative strength thing. And I think that could be quite useful. And it'd be, it's, it's fodder for a lot of research, okay? But as you can see, notice the correspondence, the uh, correlation, not correspondence. They're not talking to one another. The correlation between these two. Now, keep in mind that I actually talk with TC. This is not to scale the uh, the underlying market that we're comparing, okay? So this doesn't mean that they're weaker than the overall market here. So don't don't get confused with that. Now, if you plot a relative strength chart, then it would be you would be able to see strength and weakness. But notice that these pretty much mirror one another, okay? So I'm not sure exactly how you can time off that, but it probably would be important if you saw some really serious divergent behavior in the two. Now, Dow Theory says that you should not have divergent return. IYT, is that the transports? IYT. Let's put it in the IYT and see what happens, okay? So what I think Howard is pointing out is that, okay, transports are doing this, so the overall market's going to do this. And you know what? It might, okay? But let's just worry about price first and foremost in the S&P 500, okay? So if we do take out the bottom of this range, yeah, let's start to get worried. But I hear you. The transports bases the IYT a little bit or are beginning to break down. Let's take a look at the IYT. 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 You could do it. Okay, so yeah, I hear you. These transports, bases, the IYT, eh, looking a little dubious here. Let's throw some moving averages in. Look at that. You had a bow tie back here, so yeah, I hear you. Let's take a look at weekly. Okay, the weekly basis, not quite a bow tie, but yeah, pay attention. You get a weekly bow tie down here. That certainly scores as a negative. Now, I like to score everything, okay? If the semis begin to break down, maybe even on a weekly basis, then that's going to score as a negative. If the transports continue to break down as they have been, at least bases the IYT. Let's take a look at the regular transports here. Yep, looking pretty ugly as of yesterday. Then that scores, obviously, as a negative. But TC group, this Morningstar group here, looks a little better than the IYT. And this is what I use as a reference. So, yeah, on a relative strength basis, a little weaker than the P's, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't rush out and say the sky is falling just yet because the transports have weakened. But you got to realize that when it comes to markets, you're building a case. And what do we have now? Well, the banks have weakened. The brokerages have weakened. Financial in, in general have begun to weaken a little bit. The S&Ps have sold off a little bit. P's have sold off a little bit. Russell's a little dubious. So you kind of build the case. But the SIBI still look pretty good. The NASDAQ still looks pretty good. Most technology still looks pretty good. Hardware, software still looks pretty good. So go through the whole list of stocks. 
while you're building your case. Now, if you begin to see more and more breakdown, let's say the semis do begin to break down, well, we'll probably fire for a short or two there. And some other sectors begin to break down, begin to join in the fray, then, yeah, we'll start shorting them. But I'm not seeing enough to get too excited just yet, but check back often. Okay? So I hear you. It's it's it, They have diverged a little bit, especially with your IYT, as you pointed out, but not enough to get excited about just yet. Caution warranted. IYT never even challenged the March high. Yeah, well, I hear what you're saying. So his point is that we never did get back to this March high in the IYT. And you do have a bow tie down. It's a pretty obvious bow tie for all-time highs. You shouldn't ignore a bow tie for all-time highs. Write that down. Okay? How about that? And so far, we're going to break down a little bit. Base is the IYT. All right, MDXG. RJ has been writing very patiently. MDXJ. MDXG. Yeah, it looks like a pretty good trend to me. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that. Yeah, absolutely. It needs a little bit more knockout move, though. Okay, based on the magnitude of this trend higher. But, yeah, put that on your watch list, this uh, wide range bar here. A little dubious, but I guess you can't have everything. If you did, where would you put it, right? That's spelled with a W. Um, not bad. Keep that on your watch list. I'm 99% I'm sure it's on my watch list. I've got it marked up for some reason. Donald, that's one I've been watching. I think it's on my, let me just double check. I think that's on the watch list for today. So let's, uh, we'll leave that one alone. But you know what? I'll give you a high five on that one. Good job. I guess we could look at it. I don't want to be a big tease. I'll just delay the video out. Yeah, it's TKO. It's TKO. Sure. Um, yeah, that looks really good. Uh, my problem with this one, though, and the reason I didn't recommend it as a setup today is it does have some, some bad memories to it, although this is not, it's not too bad, okay? If I was just seeing, if we didn't have all these bad memories from 2016 past, and I was just seeing this in and of itself, I would go for it, okay? And I'd even give you a high five, okay? So it's not bad at all. It's a decent looking setup, but it does have some bad memories going way back. Jeff wants to know about Nets, also wait, waiting very patiently. N E T S. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Um, I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to IPOs. I'd almost like to see a tiny bit more knockout move. It's not bad, okay? It's not bad. Put it on your watch list. S A U C for either Andre or Arsene. I forget who. S A U C. Yeah, you know, but it's not set up. But obviously, nice trending stock. Um, but it does have, I would say, no. Even though it's way back at 2000, but Dave, boy, you're really picky. Yeah, I know. I'm like Mikey sometimes when it comes to market, especially when the market begins to falter a little bit. But you've got a couple of years of trading sitting right above your trade. And believe me, markets have very long memories, okay? Now, the further this gets back, the less important it is. And maybe somebody died, God forbid, during this period here. Um, maybe somebody just finally threw in a towel. Maybe somebody's kid has to go to school and they had to sell the stock, okay? But there's still going to be some people that are holding on. And the only way you're going to pry it from their cold, dead hands is when, uh, or their cold hands, I should say, is when is to buy it as it rallies into that overhead supply. So I'd leave it alone based on that. AMAT for Donald. That's going to be a semi. Yeah, it looks kind of interesting. I'm not a huge fan of these big fix, big fix stocks in general. Okay. But when it comes time to short, that might be a good idea. But yeah, it's certainly not bad. It is a TKO. I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback here. HV a little low, as you can see. But it's certainly not bad. I mean, I can't, I really couldn't argue too much on that one. Shop. Yeah, um, I'm watching that one on a, on a more of a pullback. Let's see where we are now. Well, we might have gotten it today. Yeah, you see, you got a nice little knockout move today. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. My only concern with this one, and I've been watching it, 
is that it's had about a 900% run-up or at least 450% run-up so far. So it's a little frothy up here. It's, a, it's, in, it's in new air or uh, thin air, I should say. Not new air, thin air. But, yeah, I can't argue with it. Nice little opening gap reversal today. And uh, that's, that's a good-looking set. That's a good-looking stock. If it wasn't already up 900% or whatever it is, 500%, I'd say for sure. But, yeah, you could certainly do a lot worse. Brett, boy, everybody's a – you guys are all over shop. Good, good, good job. Um, this one just went – this is a little bit too extreme as far as the breakout is concerned. Notice you just had this one huge wide range. It's huge. It's huge, okay? You got this huge wide range bar higher. That's 28% of the move, okay, is in that one bar round numbers. And let's see what the rest of this is. And it's still, it still moved higher from that, but a lot of times when you see so much acceleration and, and not a tremendous amount of follow-through, it, it could get a little hard to trade. So I would leave that alone. Jim wants to know about Z. Either that or I'm putting him to sleep. <laughs> Wake up, Jim. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, you got a breakout. Um, it was a little wide and loose in here, but stocks can change the personality. You've got a breakout. You've got a bit of a double top knockout. It's a little squirrely, but I hear you, and I certainly can't argue with it. It's what I call a toddler. It's a relatively new issue. It's only been out a few years. I think that's okay. All right? It's not a bad-looking setup. Um, in or above today's high, stop maybe below uh, today's low, or maybe dip back into this base. So yeah, I'm. I'll stop just short of a high five on that one. But you're you're in the hunt. STM is a semi. Yes, it is. So is Intel. Well, in a case like this, notice that it broke out, but then it came all the way back to where it broke out from. So this will actually test that. I wouldn't trade it in a pattern in and of itself, but wait for a market to break out of a base and then break out, take out pattern. Wait for it to break out the base and then take out. So short it, short it below 14 if it takes out the bottom of the base. Watch for a bow tie down on that one. But, yeah, I'd leave it alone for now unless you saw some acceleration higher and a pullback, the fact that it came back down to its thing. Yeah, uh, Jim, I've been watching now, and let's let's leave it off. The uh, that's on the land list today, so we'll leave it alone. But yeah, good eye, AXGN. Yeah, it's trending. Put on your watch list. Not set up, obviously. A little bit on the thin side, but not too bad. Nice persistent move higher. Look for a TKO or a pullback. Absolutely, Brett. Good job, uh, Brett. I'm watching that one too. It's on the land list, though. I can't talk about it. But yeah, good job. It's a semiconductor, FYI. Uh, this looks okay. Let's take a longer term look at it. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, it's had a pretty good run in here. It might be priced for perfection. I guess the only reason I would probably toss it out is that last run higher was mostly just this one big up day. Okay? So I, I think I would leave it alone and, and see if you can find something else. Like maybe some of the ones we talked about earlier. Jill, same stock. Yeah, we talked about that. That was in Landerless. Can't talk about it. But a good eye on that for sure. Yeah, my problem with this one was it's just you had this huge gap here, and it did work its way higher. So I'm not sure what should be done with it. Uh, if we zoom in a little bit, though, I can't argue with it too much because you have a nice persistent trend and a pullback. Uh, just me being a little picky, it is kind of frothy, but... It's not bad. It's not bad. I just prefer something that that didn't have such the big gap. You know, I like a gap, don't get me wrong, but kind of an extreme gap like that. And But in more recent times, it looks okay. I mean, this one I'm kind of torn on, as you can tell. Brett wants to talk about Tau, T-A-L. Yeah, it looks great. Um, I'm not a huge fan of educational stocks. And one reason is most of the time they don't look like this. Most of the time, educational stocks are really choppy, okay? Choppy, choppy. See how choppy they are? They just trade all over the place, okay? So 
I did a lot of re I've done re I've researched everything over the years, but one thing that I learned through my research is that educational stocks and shipping stocks are really, really choppy and very difficult to trend follow. Now, with that said, let's go back and take a look at it. This one seems to be a bit of an exception to the norm. And it kind of broke, it had a little tiny base here, broke out, came in, but longer term still in trend. I would say absolutely, but on more of a pullback, maybe like all the way to 110 or so. It's had such a great run in here. Let's see a pretty serious knockout. Remember, you want to make sure some people are knocked out of the market, some people are shaken out of the market, some shorts have been attracted in, okay, before looking to get aboard a trend. So, yeah, fantastic looking stock. Put on your watch list, but I would wait for a little bit more pullback. EDU, that's going to be an educational stock. EDU. Yeah, and, you know, I just told you how choppy they were, but here's two that aren't that choppy, okay? Um, I would actually like to see a little bit more knockout, but I'll know when I see it. You know, maybe let's just see how it looks on a net-net basis after the chop, after the knockout. But I wouldn't go after this one just yet. Maybe a tiny bit more knockout. And maybe I'm being a little super selective in these educational stocks just because I don't really like them. LRCX, that's going to be a semiconductor. Semiconductor. Um, it has a little bit of that trend knockout-ish look to it. It's not bad. I mean, now see, this is an okay gap. It's not so extreme. And notice that it kind of went a long ways past that little gap. Uh, got a little bit ahead of itself a few days ago, came back in. On a little bit more knockout, yeah, that's what I would call a trend knockout pattern. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Dave, hasn't it lost some steam? Yeah, but it's had such a good run in here. It's okay for it to consolidate a little bit and make that what I call a, a double top knockout pattern. And I know it gets kind of tricky because sometimes I'm like, it's lost too much momentum. We've got a net net problem. But in a case like this, it does look like a bit of a double top knockout and on a little bit more knockout move. Yes. Everybody's like, Dave, you're in a good mood. Why do you like everything? Well, because, because right now we've had, we have a lot of stocks that are trending and as pullback players, when the market pulls back, we're going to have what pullback. So we're seeing setups and there's, it, at least today. I wasn't seen a whole lot yesterday, believe it or not. Activision, we talked about that one, I think. Yeah, we talked about that one, Jim. Just rewind. BRKS, not BKRS. Yeah, well, well, I guess i got to talk about it now. That one's on Landry List, too. <laughs> yeah, it looks good, uh, given today's action. You know, I like that some of these stocks came in and had a little bit extra shakeout today. Uh, but, yeah, it looks pretty good. I mean, it's a little frothy longer term, but, I mean, that's what we that's what we sign up for as trend followers. Sometimes we have to keep following along for a long, long time. But, yeah, that looks pretty good, Jill. Uh, I would almost would have liked to have seen a tiny bit more knockout, but I really can't fault you on that one. I think that's pretty good. Hence, it being in Landry list today. FNJN. Well, you guys are good today. I must have, I got the A-team today. I hadn't had really one stinker yet. Um, longer term, you can see this is a bit of a Phoenix type of issue. Let's zoom in a little bit. Um, it can be a little wide and loose. Yeah, let's see what happens on a pullback. Put it on your watch list. Let's see what happens on a pullback. But, yeah, it's not pulling back yet, right? VRX, a bow tie. That's going to be Mr. What's-his-name stock, uh, Ackman. Did a few uh, shows of that. Absolutely, it's a bow tie. A um, lot of bad memories, though, you know. Too much overhead supply. That's like the joke about the hardware store, right? They had a hardware store, and on top of it, there was a whorehouse, and then next to the hardware store, there was a, um, or across the street, there was, what was it? It was like a retail store or something, a little five and dime. Now, what business would go, what business went out of business? Well, the hardware store, because there was too much, uh, I can't, oh, I can't tell a joke. Never mind. <laughs> that was a, that was my, that was on my final exam, my MBA class, DDD. Yeah, uh, definitely in a trend. Let's see what we got. Let's back it out a little bit. 
This one has been catching my eye lately. Longer term's got some issues, but eh, it's 2015. Let's not worry too much about that. Let's just assume that most everybody's died or given up. And let's see what we have. Yeah, too much effing overhead. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, on a knockout move, absolutely. You may tell a joke, but you can't tell a joke. Hey, I can tell a joke. <laughs> Guy works in the bar with a pair of jumper cables. Bartender comes out from behind the bar and says, hey, don't be starting anything. How's that? That's a joke. Uh, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of restaurants. HV is a little low at 21, okay? Let's take a look at our portfolio real quick, see what's happening in there as far as HV is concerned. Uh, HV, this HV is a little low, 58, 110, 57, 47. Now, notice this is the lowest HV in the portfolio, but that's a short, okay? What, we, what was I talking about earlier? HV is okay to be low if you're shorting. But as a general statement, you want a higher HV. So not a huge fan of restaurants and not a huge fan of lower HV stocks, but you certainly can't argue with this one. Okay, Jill? So I think it's okay. I like, I didn't like this drifting action here, but I like the way it's accelerated higher. So absolutely, on knockout, you're, uh, you're on it today, Jill. Good job. UCTT, yeah. This one, I've gotten a lot of accolades on this, and I want to thank you guys for, uh, on your own, you did it too. Or I think Phil pointed out that it was in my service at one point, at least on the Landry list. But yeah, this looks okay. Um, maybe a little bit more knockout move. Maybe if it got to about, uh, let's say, 19 or 18 and change, 18 or high 18s, low 19s. I leave it alone unless it knocked out a little bit as far as a re entry or whatever. Um, yeah, let me point out this Kim for you guys. Um, this is one more long. And it's a TKO after a breakout move, okay? So I was telling my peeps last night, if you want to re-enter it or if you want to, uh, for a secondary position, then somewhere above the high, maybe about right here, give a little wiggle room, and then your stop, at least based on now we have today's action, your stop would be down here. If you want to be a little bit more safer and trade fewer shares, you could put a stop down in this base. But that's a good looking setup. Now, I'm talking my position here, so take that with a grain of salt. But if I was just seeing this, in fact, last night when I was doing my scans, this this stock came up over and over again. And I'm like, man, that's great. I'm like, oh, it's Kim. So um, that's a TKO after a, for a base breakout. That's a good looking pattern there. So, yeah, keep an eye on that one. Good, uh, good call. M-Z-O-R. Yeah, on a pullback. It's, uh, it's trending, but it's not set up. Howard. A-E-I-S. Put on your watch list, that that one. Uh, this one did pull back to its prior little breakout. It looks okay. I think put it on your watch list, but let it break out to new highs and then pull back, and then we'll reevaluate it. Jive, that's a blast in the past. I don't remember if I made money or lost money on that one. Uh, no, I'm thinking of somebody. I'm thinking of some other stock. Unless we we, tra we might have traded this way back here. Um, it looks, it just kind of chops along and then gaps and chops. I'd leave it alone. It's, it's a little too, uh, it's a little all, all over the place. ACLS, ACLS, that's not bad. Um, it's a little thin. It's obviously in a trend. It's thin, but in a trend. It's not like Jesse Jackson. It's thin, but it's in a trend. It's okay. Um. It's not jumping out of me as a fantastic setup. Uh, I mean, look at something like Chem in the semis instead, or maybe some of those other semis we talked about. Put it in your watch list, though. Brett, what's to know about CC? Um, the chemicals are looking a little questionable in here. Let's take a look at the chemicals real quick. And this is, you just have to look at everything, okay? And this is why I spend so much time looking at some of these charts. You can see... Not necessarily in the world with the chemicals, but what did I just say? If you have a base breakout and you break out the top and then you break out the bottom, that's a little bit of cause for concern, but it's trying to get back in the base. But I would be, it would have to be the mother of all setups for me to, to, to buy a chemical stock right now. Now let's see if we have the mother of all setups. 
it looks okay. I mean, you could see that it, it really didn't make a quantum leap higher. I mean, obviously, it's kind of a box stock, but the pullback, it needs a little bit more pullback. And if it pulled back a little more, you'd be back to this prior base. If you're long, stay long, and this would be a great stock to be long in a longer-term trend-following mode, kind of like the Kemet, okay? And I'm not pushing Kemet, trust me. I just want to show you that sometimes you get long, and the stock makes a base, goes up, makes a base, goes up, makes a base, goes up, and then hopefully, I know you said hold, but hopefully it rents and repeat, okay? And we've been long this one for a long, long time, and it's turned into one of those box stocks, so... Nice weather, thanks, A-R-C-O. Oh, nice webinar. I was about to say, why are you telling about your weather? <laughs> I can't control the weather. weather? <laughs> uh, no, you had a gap higher, and now you had a gap down. Uh, do not take stocks, and I'm amazed at how much is just in the first, and, and, you know, I'm not, I'm selling you on free videos, right? But if you go in and watch those first four videos in the trading full circle, you'll see where I talk about, trend qualifiers against the trend. So you've got a gap lower here. Uh, I would avoid this stock. Avoid all stocks except for special cases like commodities and possibly foreign stocks, which commodities can gap around because the underlying, they're held hostage by the underlying commodity, which can gap around a little bit more. And foreign stocks, which trade overnight, and so it appears that they gapped around. So, But other than foreign stocks and commodities on a selected issue basis, I would avoid setups that have gaps against the trend. Nice webinar, not weather. Okay. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the comment. CPRX, CPRX. Um, well, put it on your watch list, okay? It's not set up, but definitely put it on your watch list. Uh, eh, I wouldn't even put it on my watch list. It's got a lot of bad memories to it. I think that there's a lot of other stocks that are uh, trending that you could look at. COHU. Okay, we're almost down to the nitty gritty here. Um, it's okay. It pulled back to its prior little base in here. Uh, I think I would pass on that. And then the other thing to notice is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 days in the pullback. Too many days in the pullback. Okay. Now, a few weeks ago, it looked okay as a TKO, all right? But now it's 18 days in the pullback, too many days in the pullback. Leave it alone. You could find something better in the semis. I know you could do it. You could do it. Joe wants to know about MXL. MXL looks pretty good, Joe. Uh, it could use a little bit more pullback, okay? Nice little base breakout. It could use a little bit more pullback, but obviously not all the way back to the base. So that's not bad. You're welcome, Peter. Anytime, man. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> Got a lot of friendlies in your day. That's nice. Um, well, you had this one big breakout, and it's retraced most of the breakout so far. And it just looks a little funky. It's kind of hard for me to explain. It's not bad. I mean, you can certainly do a lot worse. Make sure you wait. Let it take out uh, whatever this is, 15 and change up here, if you do think about going after it. 1541. It's, it's not bad. Thanks, Reverend Dave. You're welcome. Huh? TTD? Yeah, TTD I've been, uh, I like. I've been watching that one. It's been kind of cool. Um, actually, the gap is too big. Yeah, I've been watching it because it's frustrating because it took off. It set up kind of perfectly, and it didn't, um, it didn't really trigger whatever, and then it took off. That's why I've been watching that one. Uh, but, yeah, it's not I, – the gap is too extreme in here, like we've been talking about throughout. All right, we're going to probably have to go ahead and wrap things up based on – oh, sure. Did we talk about that one? Yeah, we talked about that one. All right, uh, as you can tell, I love doing these shows. I'm having a blast doing them. I keep doing them as long as you guys and girls continue to show up. So thank you for doing that. Uh, anything unanswered, daviddavelander.com. Be patient with me. It might not be until next show. Till I get back with you, just because I got a lot going on with launching of this course, and uh, markets are kind of nuts. So, a little bit doing a little stuff, currency stuff, kind of keep me busy too, and so just a lot going on. But anyway, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again, and uh, hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls next week. You're welcome, R.J., Craig, Andre, Leon, Joe. You're welcome, and Brett. Thank you so much. <laughs>